um, Gandhi. What, what different characterizations do you find in this uh, very, very different work? Well, there are basically um, four completely separate characters that make it all the more interesting. And of all things, I, now I'd, I'd be curious what Bruce thinks of this, but I find um, the Satyagraha was much more difficult, at least for my role. I know uh, Tatiana and Tim have incredibly uh, difficult rhythmic things. And uh, for me, this is much easier ry rhythmically, uh, these roles are this time. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> it, it is, what, what, what's the term, deceptively simple, in that the audience sits there and hears a beat and think, oh, that's nice, it, you know, mm. they don't realize that in that steady eighth note, as Bruce said, this steady rhythm that we hear, it's broken into fives, to sevens, to twelves, to threes, you know, and as a singer, as a performer, you always have to, I call, keep the computer going. I keep <laughs> that visual computer in my brain and think, okay, here we're coming to the ten, okay, whoops, here's the four, but I think that an eight, Here's the, you know, you just, and once you kind of shut off the computer, you go, uh-oh, <laughs> uh-oh, <laughs> computer breakdown. <laughs> but, do, you, um, do you ever have trouble unwinding when one of these performances is <laughs> over? <laughs> We've all discussed that, you know, waking up in the middle of the night and having that pattern or motive going around or waking up first thing in the morning or after a nap. And or going for a walk even and the rhythm you go, you go left, right, bump, 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 bump. Oh, no, no, stop. Stop that rhythm, please. <laughs> um. <laughs> the thing that I've noticed the most uh, that for me makes this piece so uh, exciting is the incredible rhythms that he has done. Wonderful, I guess, Spanish rhythms and uh, wonderful syncopations and thrilling chorus. I think his chorus writing is just brilliant. Patricia Schumann, this work is called The Voyage. It's uh, about a voyage into the unknown, and that's very much what we're experiencing tonight. I mean, this is the maiden voyage for the voyage. There is no performance history. You are creating these roles. Can you tell us a bit about the character of the commander you play in the third act that's coming up now? Uh, what exactly happens in this act? I know it takes place in 2092. In the first act, your character was a commander of a spacecraft that crashed to Earth in the Ice Age. Now, are these two characters related? The, the commander in the third act is, uh, in many millenniums later, a descendant of the alien commander in the first act. And that's why, as she gives the speech before they take off in the rocket ship, she keeps um, feeling some sense memory in her body, and uh, she senses that there are these bird-like creatures, and she keeps making this movement over her head. So that's the only um, <clears throat> indication visually in the third act that she's a descendant, but indeed she is. So it's really almost like ancestral memory. Exactly. That's, that's precisely what it is. Uh, what is it like to present the world premiere of a work, Bruce Ferdin. I think we're all excited to be a part of it because it is a, a journey of discovery. And we have the composer here and the librettist here, and so there's this marvelous sharing that takes place. Every act that we do, uh, afterwards I speak with Philip. How was the tempo? Did it build enough? Did it go? Because one thing is to keep it together, eighth note to eighth note. Another thing is to keep that 45-minute arch for the first act or 50-minute arch for the third act. There's this, again, this, uh, I think with Philip's music, there's so many levels going on. The level of the vertical and the horizontal, the level of the different instruments, the level of the drama with the music, and how they all not necessarily support each other, but cross each other, maybe even collide. Mm -hmm. Timothy Noble. I'm less nervous uh, in a situation like this than, in, than, for instance, doing Falstaff or Rigoletto or something like that, because inevitably somebody will compare you to someone else. And I don't have to worry about that here, <laughs> because, <laughs> you know, I have only my own expectations to deal with, and uh, I know if I do my job then, and do the best that I can, and uh, that it'll be all right. Tatiana Troianos. Well, it absolutely is a, an enormously rewarding, enriching experience to have such a great team put this together it's it's uh, once in a lifetime i think we're just about to go to act three of the voyage now and before we sign off uh for the evening actually i'd like to ask if there are any moments to come in the final act that perhaps our listeners at home should be listening to especially obviously they'll be listening to the entire opera but are there any moments that you would especially highlight as particularly precious to you. Patricia Schumann. 
Well, I, um, I'm just thinking of my own um, music in the third act. I love the speech that I do before I get into the rocket ship. And I speak about the, you know, what we try to do, I say, all through the ages, we have sought to know what once had been unknowable. And then um, when I'm in the rocket, we have a very lovely quartet that we sing, each of us, into the, um, or the phone of our headset in the rocket ship, which is also not clear for the audience, but it's something for them to think about when we each speak individually to the person we're going to leave behind. When I first looked at the libretto, I thought I might, might be speaking to one of the pilots or one of the space twins, the Earth twins. Then I realized um, this is to the person I'm leaving behind, and I don't know when I'll see them again. Timothy Noble. <laughs> well, there's one moment at the very end of the, almost at the very end of the opera, when he is, Columbus has had his confrontation in his mind with Isabella. And it's not a sung moment. It's when this beautiful theme comes back. What it plays, a flute? Is it a flute? Noble. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it is so haunting and so beautiful. It is, it's my favorite moment in the opera. It really is. It's really wonderful. Of course, you're looking forward to hearing it. I'd like to thank very much my guests for uh, taking time in their schedule to come and talk with me. And we now return you to Peter Allen in the Texaco Broadcast booth. And our thanks to you, Tim Page, and your guests for these intermission discussions. Act three of the voyage begins 100 years from now in the year 2000. We're talking with Philip Glass in his Manhattan home about his opera, The Voyage. Philip, in the past, you've written a number of biographical operas. Uh, you've done studies of Einstein and Gandhi and the Pharaoh Akhenaten. From what I understand, when you came to write The Voyage, uh, you had a rather different approach to the subject in well, mind. Well, this really isn't uh, a portrait of Columbus. He appears in the opera, in the second act, and in the epilogue after the third act. But in fact, uh, it's really an opera about uh, the spirit of discovery. Uh, and the, in fact, the things about Columbus are mostly imaginary. Uh, it's not in any way a historical treatment. I felt especially in this year where there are, there are films about Columbus and there are, uh, there are books about Columbus, there's so much information about Columbus that another, uh, another work that was just more information just seemed unnecessary. Besides which, I, I've never felt that opera was a very good place uh, to serve up reality. It seems that uh, opera is really a kind of poetry and that's uh, it's where the poetic spirit can really reign. So that my approach to Columbus was really uh, a kind of an imaginary Columbus in a way. And, and let's say I emphasize an aspect of Columbus that interested me. And for me it was the fact that he was uh, an explorer, that he was a man of courage, that he was someone who left the world that was familiar to him and, and, and ventured into a completely unknown uh, universe. There are several other historical personages in the, in the work, or at least peripheral to it, too. Uh, well, there's Isabella, of course. Uh, but the relationship between uh, Columbus and Isabella is not, uh, uh, it's, it's not a, a his, history book uh, relationship. It's actually kind of steamy, <laughs> to tell you the truth. <laughs> well, that could have been the history book, too. Uh, one thing that's interested me about a number of your operas uh, recently has been the fact that they're all set in different times, uh, in actually uh, times in which characters could not possibly have lived in both times, like ancient Egypt and a modern tour of Egypt in yeah, Akhenaten. Right. And then we have really three different eras in the voyage. Yeah, I guess I'm just a, a born time traveler, Tim. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but I think that the, for modern audiences, the idea of uh, uh, of looking at history, uh, of looking at the present and looking at the historical past and looking at the future is something that, in a funny way, we're more accustomed to think that way. We, we don't have such a, a rigid idea of the present and the past as we did in the, uh, as we uh, as as a culture we did formerly. I don't know whether that's because we really are truly entering the age of space travel and the, the world of science fiction is now becoming the world that we live in. And how long did it take you to write uh, the voyage? Well. That's always an interesting question with the operas, and it's not so different from the other operas. That, generally speaking, it takes me about a year to prepare the material. That means 
after I have the commission, I, uh, I find the designer and the director and the writer. And we form a team. Uh, and we spent about a year working with, in this case, the first one who had to make his contribution was David Huang. I wanted the libretto first. And he worked from the story treatment that I gave him. Um, uh, and then uh, David uh, Poutney, who was the stage director, we actually shaped the libretto in two ways. First of all, what I needed as a composer. But secondly, and almost as important a way, what David really required as a director, what he thought made uh, the best sense dramatically. The first year was spent on the libretto. The second year, I really spent uh, writing the music. At the same time that Bob Israel began doing the designs, I'd say it takes about a year, maybe a little bit more, to do the music once I have everything together. Uh, then it takes another year just to get the production together. So you really have to talk about three years to do an opera this, of uh, this scale. You've also worked with uh, many different forms of opera. Uh, how would you describe the voyage? Is it is it more in the classic tradition of opera, breaking up into ensembles, scenes, uh, or is it, again, uh, somebody once called Einstein's solid state? Um, <laughs> no, I think it's a it's a little uh, closer to what people might recognize in terms of set pieces. Uh, on the other hand, it's, a, it's a somewhat different from the other from the other works in that. In this work, uh, knowing I had the Met Orchestra to write for, I wrote uh, for the orchestra somewhat differently than I usually do. In the past, written fairly conservatively for the orchestra. Uh, in this case, the orchestra writing, orchestra writing is much more uh, dense and more colorful. Uh, the chorus plays an important part in this opera. And uh, 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 working with the chorus at the Met has been fun because uh, they found that they are, they have a starring part in the opera and they enjoy it very much. Now one thing which I find quite interesting in the score of the voyage is it's uh, perhaps the most chromatic music you've written in many, many years. Uh, it is uh, less reductive as as you've occasionally um, called your music. Yeah. Uh, uh, I don't like to use the word simple because I don't think there's anything really simple about it. But uh, you have often in your music deliberately limited um, compositional elements. And uh, you seem to be gradually adding a lot of them back. Well, it's taken me a long time, Tim. I mean, I think it's been 25 years since I wrote uh, Music and Fifths, which was just, I think, about a six-note melody that just was written in fifths and went on for about 25 minutes, if you may remember. It was a, that was a highly reductive piece. But isn't uh, it nice to have a distinctive style? My ideal has always been, and though it's a, it's a very hard ideal to achieve, but what I, I would like best of all if someone says, I heard a piece and I, and I just thought, and I found out it was yours, I had no idea you had written it. It didn't sound like you. That's what I like. I like when people say that it doesn't sound like you. Now, tonight, for our radio listeners, uh, we will not have that visual counterpart. Uh, I wonder if there are any words of advice you would give to somebody who's genuinely interested in your music and uh, really wants to understand it, but can't perhaps get past the repetitive structures at the start. Well, I don't think they'll find that much in this opera anyway, in terms of, I think, if we tell people to look for them, they may find them. But if we don't, if, if we don't uh, the idea of repetitive structures in this music is really not I don't feel so crucial. Uh, uh, I think the best thing is to, uh, is to hopefully, to be carried away by uh, the drama of the story and the drama of the music. Uh, in terms of what uh, people listening to the radio, when I, you know, I grew up listening to the radio, like a, a lot of people that are still alive, and the great fun about listening to the radio is that you imagine things. You know, and that's true for even when, when, I, when I hear opera on the radio, I always, I, I design my own sets. I have my own costumes. I, that's what I do, and I think a lot of people do that. Uh, the great, the great thing about the medium of radio is, is that uh, that the audience uh, has the opportunity to, to to supply that themselves, and they do. We'll hear more from Philip Glass in the next intermission, but now let's turn to the librettist David Henry Huang. Now, there's the old debate about uh, first the music, then the words. Uh, how did it work for you folks? For us, it's always um, first the words, then the music, which I suppose makes my life a lot easier. Um, and it makes Phillips somewhat more difficult because uh, there is a particular meter or lack of meter in certain cases that he has to deal with. Um, in uh, the case of the voyage, we started out with a text, a treatment, um, basically a breakdown of scenes that Philip had come up with on his own, uh, predating my involvement in this project. 
And so it was re really a matter of my filling that out and then having some meetings with him and the director, David Poutney, and then doing a couple other drafts. And once everybody was happy with the libretto, then Philip went away and composed the music for a couple of years. And now what about the rather complicated figure of Christopher Columbus? Uh, is writing an opera about him is rather um, a trickier subject, I think, than it might have been considered even 10 years ago. And I'm wondering about how you went about approaching this uh, very controversial character. Well, Columbus has always been sort of a symbol of the way that we perceive ourselves here in, in, in this hemisphere. And consequently, the perceptions of him have changed as our vision of ourself has changed. Um, 20, 30 years ago, the notion that Columbus was sort of a conqueror, a, a civilizing influence uh, that brought uh, you know, light to the savages or whatever might have been fairly readily accepted. Now we're in a day when uh, we're starting to question who we are as a people, and there's no single ethnic group that's going to be a majority in another 20 or 30 years. Consequently, our perception of Columbus becomes much more complicated, too, and all the way to the charges now that he was simply someone who instigated genocide and ruined the ecology. Um, you know, and I think that what I tried to do in this, in the libretto, was take into account the truths of both those extremes, but synthesize them into a perception of someone who was, at the essence, a human being, and a human being that has complicated motives, that does some things that are right, and does some things that are wrong, and oftentimes doesn't understand the full impact of what it is that he's uh, achieved. I mean, we all know that Columbus didn't even set out to find a new continent. He set out to find Asia. So there's a certain amount of accident and serendipity that uh, comes into the lives of all the characters in this opera as they go on their various voyages and try and make their different discoveries, and I think that Columbus is certainly no exception. Of course, Columbus isn't the only voyager here. Yeah, it's actually a triptych of stories um, about three different discoveries, two of them fictional and one of them, um, the Columbus sort of quasi-historical. Um, and I think that one of the things that I tried to bring to the project was how to tie these three stories together thematically. Um, certainly one of my interests has to do simply with uh, the clash of cultures, the ways in which they fuse, the ways in which they conflict, and the the uh, emotions that are stirred up in those sorts of meetings. I think it ends up being an opera partially about the way in which people, with their sort of simple, very human, sometimes even petty motives, get caught up in historical movements in kind of great uh, sociological uh, eras that might be larger than anything they expect. And certainly the overriding theme, which is one of the things that I think Philip wanted to bring in, was the way in which the all voyages begin in the mind and the kind of intellectual voyage precedes any physical. But then there gets a point where the mind goes so far and then the body has to take over and then all sorts of things happen that one can't necessarily plan for and that's part of the, uh, what the voyage is about. We've just heard from composer Philip Glass and librettist David Henry Huang. And now here is Tim Page with members of the production team and cast. His conversation begins with director David Pountney and set designer Robert Israel. How did you develop your concept of the voyage and decide exactly what the look of the production would be? Well, Mr. Poutney. The interesting thing about Philip's work is that it, it, it affords enormous visual scope. I mean, I think he, as a composer, has always been very involved with visual artists and taken a lot of inspiration from visual artists. And so when you're beginning to work with a designer on on a score like this it, it, you're presented with a completely different type of canvas on which to work out um, the structure of a design because uh, the music and the text and the images um, are not bound up in telling a story moment by moment in the way that they are in a more conventional linear opera in this case bob and i of course, we're facing the interesting problem, the visual problem that this piece presents, in that it operates really in three very different visual styles and three very different visual periods. The first act is, is in the past, in the, but it's so far into the past that it's in a kind of futuristic past. Um, and the last act is in the future, but somehow has more to do with the present day 
uh, than we hope the future will have. Uh, and the middle act is in an actual historical period, the 15th century, but even so, uh, not really attempting, thank goodness, to be a naturalistic one. So Bob really was faced with uh, an extraordinary problem of pulling these three things together. And how did you approach that, Robert Israel? Well, um, very simply, uh, with a dialogue, uh, uh, through a dialogue with David. And uh, I guess you do this kind of dance around, uh, around the libretto. And uh, as the dance gets more frenetic, something, um, something takes shape. I'm not exactly sure how the creative process manifests itself. Um, other than to say that we, there was a dialogue. And then, of course, uh, costumes came in with Dunya Ramikova. When, when did you uh, join the, uh, the dialogue and make it a three-way discussion? Well, I, I was brought into the process fairly late, uh, a year before the opening, which for opera is usually a short time, since there are close to 500 costumes. Um, so I had the benefit of coming into a dance that was already somewhat designed, uh, and that actually made it more exciting. It was more of a challenge to get in step with everybody else. And then, Gil Wexler, you came into this at, uh, at what particular point with the lighting? Well, about the same point, about a year before, but I was, I was terribly excited because I had, I had read the libretto and listen to the music we did a we did a sort of scratch tape of the music and the things that i saw were nothing like what i had imagined we're working together towards a central point yet we all we all have things to contribute but this was this was completely different because there's so many different ways to do this if you read the libretto by itself and this this gave me lots of ideas and lots of inspiration uh, david poutney and Robert Israel have worked with uh, Philip Glass on a number of occasions. And was there anything specific to this work uh, that you could also tie in with the Glass works that you've done before? There was, I think, an interesting uh, problem that we set out to solve at the beginning of the piece, which was um, a representation of a prehistoric spaceship. Uh, and it in discussing this idea, it became very clear to us that, in fact, the whole iconography of spaceships was something that was still completely derived from some 1950s comic books. And they now build spaceships costing zillions of dollars that look exactly like the ones that appeared in those comic books. And that there was no reason why this prehistoric spaceship should look anything like that at all. And so we came up with a kind of completely abstract and much more, I suppose, meditative idea. And that visual solution, in fact, provided us with a kind of language of a symbolic language, a language of shapes, basically, which Bob then has used throughout the evening as a way of pulling together these three very disparate acts. Robert Israel. Yeah, I, uh, I'll say a few things about... Uh, what things look like. Perhaps it would be easier to, easiest to start with the second act. There is an incredible dream that's taking place, and uh, uh, what we've tried to do is create an atmosphere that is dreamlike on the, st on the stage. And uh, the first part of the second act takes place um, at the court of Isabella. And that court, which is askew and somewhat bizarre, uh, dislocates itself uh, from a central portion of the stage and moves upstage, leaving, um, I guess, what I will call the plaza uh, in front of the court as a ship adrift on a uh, dark sea with a sky in back of it. And the dream shifts at that point so that uh, it becomes a meditative um, sequence of events that that uh, represent Columbus's uh, sailing from the old world to the new, and at the same time, his fears and, uh, and, and trepidations about, about the adventure he's, he's on. Well, Dunya should maybe say something about, about the, 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 yes. the costumes in that act. Yes. The costumes are kind of a combination of research, of 15th century research, 
the period that Columbus lived in uh, and the court of Isabella and again the dreamlike quality that we were trying to imbue this with so they are not strictly um, correct in a sense they're sort of an imaginative interpretation I hope and uh, they are quite grand there is a lot of gold uh, part of it has to do of course with the quest that Columbus had and um, there, there are a lot of um, very abstracted um, church dignitaries, men wearing tremendously large mitres and huge cloaks uh, to represent the power of the church in, in Spain. And uh, then once we move into the, the voyage on the sea, uh, Columbus has visions, and these visions were basically based on things that David had read about of sort of monstrous uh, human beings. We call them sea monsters, but they're not really sea monsters. They're basically nightmares that Columbus is having. And I looked at a lot of medieval and Renaissance pictures of, of the sort of things that people were terrified of in that period, of what was monstrous to them. And that's how we arrived at these so-called sea monsters, but they're all really a vision of Queen Isabella in Columbus's mind. So sometimes she's beautiful, and sometimes she's a monster, and sometimes she's a little child. Um, let's talk a little bit about the relationship between Columbus and Isabella. Uh, we're talking with Timothy Noble and Tatiana Troianos. Uh, anyone want to feel that? Uh, Timothy Noble. Well, I think... I mean, uh, from Philip Glass's point of view, it doesn't matter who they are. And it could be anybody, for that matter, almost. I think that Philip was quoted of one time saying that it, he doesn't really particularly care about Columbus because if you want to find out something about Columbus, you can read a history book. <laughs> but that's not particularly true either. Um, so for me, it was kind of difficult in, in knowing that that wasn't particularly important the Isabella Col Columbus thing. The fact that there is a, re a love relationship on stage between this two that is never quite confirmed is important. But for me, I'm a very historical kind of person, I think, and of course that came into play for me. So what I had to do was take that and make a real person out of him. So we can play these sequences that are almost on a metaphysical level that are very difficult to play and it's kind of in and out of reality mm -hmm. and uh, the most important thing is that the audience gets the fact that she was a major major influence on his life on many levels maybe as a hopeful lover that never happened a mother a queen you know his supplier of money his support a lot of things and that's the thing I think he's getting at uh, on a real level, at the end of the opera, when he dies, she's already dead, she comes back to him again, and it's like, don't you recognize what you did in the name of the church and God? It's your pride and your vanity and all this lust for gold. And can't you see what it is? It's the devil. And he rejects this, ultimately. He, he rejects her, and he goes on his own voyage, you know. So an ambiguous muse, so to speak. It's really hard to play. I'm, I'm still sorting it out. <laughs> As, you know, I really am. But it's very interesting, and it's a lot to think about. It really is. It, it sounds like a lot to carry in one character, Tatiana Troianos. <laughs> well, it was interesting when we first started staging. Of course, I had also studied the history and the background, and I, I realized that Queen Isabella was not what we were portraying here. It was something completely different. What I loved about it was that it was all in in Columbus's mind, in his fantasy, what he was thinking, what was past, what is now, what could be the future. It, there is some room, of course, to, to move from one of those states to the other, but sometimes I'm not quite sure where I am, you know, with him. And, but it's wonderful to let my imagination just go with it, you know? And I find it really fascinating to, to, to portray her, not, of course, as she was, because as, as uh, Timothy says, you can go to the library and you can find out how Queen Isabella was, but to really portray all those things that he 
felt she was, and in fact that she probably was. Certainly she was a great, great supporter of his, and he believed that she was really the only person who was behind him all of the way. I really believe that. And, um, and so I think, of course, he felt very, very close to her, but um, it's, it's, just, it's very fascinating to, to try and grasp a few of these ideas and to make something of it, you know? Now, Douglas Perry, we've been talking a little bit about uh, characters who, uh, w with Columbus and Isabella, it's been said that they could have been almost anybody. With you, you're actually two different people, but you're the same person to some extent. Exactly. Tell me how that exactly. works. <laughs> well, it's, it's a fabulous concept. As, uh, as the scientist in the very first, first scene, um, the key words that I sing are, the voyage lies where the vision lies, there. And that sets up the entire opera and the whole thing. Whatever we envision, what we ha you have to have the vision before you can have the reality of something. And so it continues from 50,000 years back to Columbus's vision of what he was after to going on to the third act, to the future. But without the vision, there's nothing. So uh, the, the scientist in the first act really sets that the whole tone for the for the opera. This is Carol Van Ness. You can keep on top of all of the Mets radio and television performances with a Mets broadcast guide. In it, you'll find a week-by-week -week listing of casts, stories, and start times for each opera coming to you from the Met this year. And there's a special section for the Mets telecasts as well. Don't miss a moment of this new broadcast season. Write to Met Broadcast Guide, Box 50, New York, New York, one double o two three.